Hi, this is Renaud Duran from Sophist, and I'm going to cover the electrically caused injuries as explained in Technical Standard IEC 62368-1, or more uh, accurately, how to prevent these injuries in IT equipment, telecommunication equipment, and audio video products. So, a quick disclaimer: it's only a high-level overview. Okay, you will still need to read the standard carefully. And we're not lawyers; we're not compliance consultants. So let's go right into it. Uh, I found this on the internet, it's very um, uh, visual. So basically the body becomes part of an electrical path. This high voltage and you know, or high current and, and it can go through the body like this, then it's very dangerous. It can uh, severely injure people or kill them. Okay, so the IEC standard provides us with this simple diagram. There's an energy source and here we're only going to look at uh, electrical source. Okay. And the safeguards, typically electrical insulation, but it's not the only one, as we will see. And the safeguard prevents the energy source from reaching the body, or at least uh, reaching the body above certain limits. So let's look at these limits. The conceptual framework basically is this. Uh, ES1, electrical source, uh, one, two, three, right? It is ES1, which means basically safe not going to hurt or, or just very slightly okay if the voltage is very low and or, or the current is very low okay it's a bit more complicated than that we'll get to it in the next slides es2 might uh, send you to see a doctor might send you to a hospital es3 uh, might be pretty serious and uh, actually uh, kill someone okay now, it's a little bit more complicated, as I mentioned. ES1, okay, must not exceed the limits under normal and abnormal operating conditions, and under a single fault condition, not of a safeguard, okay, if it's, if there's a single fault condition, but no safeguard has single fault condition, it does not exceed TDS1. And if there's a single fault condition of a basic safeguard, or of a supplementary safeguard, then it, do, it must not exceed ES2. So this is a pretty uh, bad situation already. It must not exceed ES2. Okay, if it exceeds ES2, it's ES3. And again, ES3 is really the red area here that you really want to avoid. Uh, okay, and then ES2 itself. Yes, it exceeds uh, ES1 uh, in at least one of the, 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 the dimensions, but also in all of these conditions, Either the voltage or the current does not exceed the limits of for ES2. If one of them, the voltage or the current, exceeds the limit for ES2, even if it's just in single fault condition, oops, sorry, then uh, it is ES3. Okay, and basically ES3 is everything else worse than that. Now, how to know what are these limits for the voltage and the current? It depends on the the frequency, whether it's DC or AC and so on. So for example, here, the simplest case, let's say it's a DC current. The current is below, uh, let's say, no, no, no higher than uh, 60 volt and no higher than 2 milliamp. Okay, it's ES1. Now, if it gets higher, it gets to ES2. If it gets higher uh, on any one of these, it's more than ES2, it is ES3. Okay, and th 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 this is a long table. Okay, we're not going to go through all of this. Now, it's very useful when designing a new product to have a block diagram like this and to think, okay, what is a level 3? So here you can see ES3, okay, mains input, this is always ES3. Uh, you also see PS, which is for um, flammability, thermal, etc. Okay, you need to think of different types of energy, not just electrical energy, but it's very helpful here even just looking at energy source. So, mains input, okay, that's always ES3. And then it goes down, okay, this is ES1, ES1, uh, ES1, okay, a rear fan, however, mechanical source, yeah, two, uh, there might be something, because uh, there's some, um, some moving parts and so on, right? Uh, but this is outside the scope of this training. So at least you really clarify what is ES3, what is ES2, what is ES1, and then based on that, you can plan for the safeguards. Okay, what kind of enclosure is it? This is very important. Okay, 
Now, let's just look at ordinary persons. Let's leave the other cases aside. In most cases, this is the, the, the situation. If it's ES1, okay, class 1 for electrical, okay, so ES1, there's no need for a safeguard. If it's ES2, then there has to be either basic safeguard, okay, or in the special case where, for example, the uh, the product has to be serviced, something has to be uh, removed, replaced, and so on, there has to be an instructional safeguard, which might say, do not do this yourself, you have to bring it to a special repair uh, center, etc., which will also say, make sure children uh, do not access the product when you, uh, you remove the safeguard. Okay, And if there is a class 3 energy source, this is very serious, it has to be a basic and a supplementary safeguard. Just one basic safeguard is not sufficient okay, uh, to prevent this ordinary person from being injured. Okay, Now, it goes into a lot more than this. This is just a little snapshot. The, the, the accessible circuits, right, meaning that you don't need a special tool to go in, in uh, the back of the product, etc., etc. Like most people can just access it readily. So I have a double safeguard or reinforced safeguard to an ES3 source, okay, that's directly connected to the mains. In this case, you really need to have uh, very serious safeguards. They, they cover the case of what happens under single fault condition in, uh, in, in different cases. Okay, I'm not going to go through all this. So we keep talking about safeguards. What kind of safeguards are important here, are, are, are very useful, are typically used? So, of course, insulation right? Clearance, creepage. So what does that mean? In the case of a, a groove like this or a, a rib like this or uh, basically this really helps us uh, make the difference obvious. So the blue one is the clearance. So air, so basically these two, for example, these two poles, let's say high, high and low, okay, uh, they have to be separated. Well, they're insulated by air in, in this case. This is the clearance. In this case, Clearance is calculated like this, as the, the line of um, the, the, the direct air path, yeah, the shortest air, air path, basically. The creepance, if this is a, a sort of a V-shaped uh, notch like this, so creepance will follow the, the contour, right, of this shape, except when there's a short distance like this, then you, you need to calculate it like this, okay? If it's in this shape, it just goes all along the contour. Okay, so this is clearance and uh, creepance, uh, solid insulation, of course, and there's a lot of things, uh, glass, porcelain, uh, plastic, various kinds of plastic, etc., etc., can be used. They can be single, double, reinforced. The standard goes into all of this. It's rather complicated. If the, the insulation materials are too close to each other also, it can be, uh, can, can, can be an, a problem. Okay, there are, there are all the other kinds of safeguards where you keep the voltage and you know, all the current to begin with to a safe level, then you don't need to worry so much because, again, if it's, an, for example, ES2 source, you don't need as many safeguards as an ES3 source. Okay, protective earth, very important, yeah, to make sure the, it's not going to really want to go through the body, basically. Preventing access to certain parts of the product. This is rather obvious. If people cannot go to certain parts where, for example, there are live wires and, and things like that, uh, it is safer. And uh, the rating of the components. Very, very important to pay attention to that. Okay. Now, there's a lot of dimensions. Standard goes into it's a lot, of, a lot of complexity. If you really want to go into all the small details, for example, pollution. Okay, if it's uh, for example outdoor or there's a lot of uh, dust and a lot of other materials, right? You have different pollution degrees. You need to take into take it into account into some of the calculations. Okay, but really, I'm not going to keep going over this. You have to really uh, get the standard, read it. It's a really deep topic okay training course would spend would really take hours and hours to go through all this maybe uh maybe more than a day okay just for electrical shock and really the conclusion is if you can yeah uh, get a standard 
of the shelf power supply make sure it itself is pre-certified doesn't have to be UL so for the North American market uh, UL, CSA, ETL, MET, SGS, TUV and so on there's a number of NRTLs that are uh, allowed to do that uh, if it's in the uh, for the EU where well, CE might be sufficient okay under the low voltage directive uh, basically take a serious supplier for the power source make sure it's it's pre-certified double check the certificate and that's it for this training course. I hope it was useful. Thanks.